Hi, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports History and Today Conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axel Bank, and today we're going to speak with Martin Woodock, the author of American Vikings How the Norse Sailed into the Lands and Imaginations of America. He's written dozens of books and is an expert on Christianity and a frequent media commentator. Mr. Woodock, thanks so much for being here. Good to be with you. Before we start our interview, I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. I do not remember a time in my life where I hadn't at least heard the word Vikings and didn't know that they'd made some kind of journey. I always knew that. As an avid sports fan and child football video gamer, I knew the world's, the sports world's interpretation of them. The Minnesota Vikings, clad in purple, their ear horn standing out. Martin Wittick writes that the Vikings, the actual Vikings, not the Minnesota Vikings, have indeed made a long journey, not only physically, but through our imaginations and our popular culture. So, Martin, when and how did you first realize that our understanding of what a Viking is needed to be explored in a book and that our modern understanding had to be stripped of myth and finally grounded in reality, not the football Vikings, but the real Vikings. How did you figure that out? Well, this was a combination of two big interests of mine. I've, I've always been very interested in uh, European medieval history, um, particularly early medieval history, and that included the Viking Age and the explosion of raiders, traders, settlers out of Scandinavia from the 8th century to about 1100. So I've always been interested in that. Uh, and Vikings are tremendously popular on both sides of the pond um, and and globally people are very interested in Vikings so that was one thread I've always been interested in the Vikings where they went what they did why they were significant but recently I've become very interested in what you might call deep stories the way in which communities use the past to say something about themselves to try to express something about themselves now deep stories can be fictional deep stories can be a, a version of the past uh, deep stories can be relatively accurate uh, but i've become very interested in that as well and, and we live in in a world today of very much contested deep stories people use in the past to try to explain aspects of the present so these two things came together in fact, recently i'd written a book called mayflower lives uh, which looked at the impact of the mayflower settlement on the deep story of the USA. Uh, I then went on with, with a reporter friend on, in, in the UK to write a book called Trump and the Puritans, which tried to explore why there was such a great deal of support for uh, candidate Trump and then President Trump um, amongst American evangelicals. Deep stories once again. And as I began to do this, I realised, of course, that the Vikings are very much part of many, many states deep stories. And in fact, even before my book was published in 2023, Putin had invaded Ukraine. And only a few years earlier than that, he put up a great Viking statue in Moscow, because Vikings in the East, who were the founders of the first Russian state of Kiev Rus, are part of the contested story of Ukraine and of Russia. So all around us, we see these deep stories. And often, Vikings are in the mix as well. I began to realize that in the USA, as elsewhere, Vikings are being utilized and have been used positively and very negatively at times as part of explaining who people think they are and the communities they think they should be. And the result was American Vikings, which, as you may have seen from the subtitle, is in fact subtitled How the Norse Sailed into the Lands. And crucially, the imaginations of America. And that was where the book came from. Two threads came together. When I imagine a Viking, I imagine the big fur coat and the horns. Um, what did actual Vikings look like? What did they wear? Not while they were at home necessarily, but when they were at work, when they were off being Vikings, what did they look like? What would we see if we could see the actual Vikings in front of us? 
Well, the first shocking piece of information is you've got to ditch the horned helmets. Now, this is a real problem <laughs> because, you know, if, if you Google Viking costumes, they've all got horned helmets. We've got to <laughs> ditch the horned helmets. There's not a single archaeological example of horned helmets. We think that probably is a confusion with carvings and rock paintings from Scandinavia that show deities with horned helmets and with winged helmets. And that's got into the mix. So ditch the horned helmets. We're talking about mostly young men from Scandinavia, from countries we'd now call Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Uh, there will be women as well in there as well. Big argument about to what extent women actually contributed to the, 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 the violent raiding side of it. I think probably primarily we're talking about young men who were involved in what one might call muscular free enterprise, people that burst out of Scandinavia, first raiding, stealing, slave taking. Uh, the Dublin slave market, for example, was a huge market of people who were taken from as far as North Africa, who then ended up in Dublin and elsewhere, bursting out of Scandinavia, raiding, stealing, but then also trading, I guess, where the opposition was weak, they traded. Sorry, where the opposition was weak, they raided, quite the opposite. And where the opposition was strong, they maybe did a bit of trading. Those are two quite significant differences. So where they're ready for them, a bit of trading. Where they're not, it's raiding, eventually turning to settlement, in which case we then have the history of Normandy, of, of, of Britain change fundamentally, Ireland change and then on from there to Iceland and to Greenland. Was there like a government of Vikings or, I hate to use the term, but was, was there like a terroristic aspect of this? Was it a piracy thing? Was there a leader of the Vikings or did they represent a, sort of a, a national government somewhere? There's there's no unifying government at the time. State formation is just beginning in Denmark and a little bit later in Norway and then later again in Sweden. So what we see is lots and lots of different warlords, fighting warlords, who for various reasons decide to get the booty with which they fund their lifestyle abroad. We, we know, for example, that in the 8th century, changes in the Islamic caliphate in the Middle East cut off the supply of silver to Scandinavia. Often things like amber and furs and slaves were traded down into the Islamic Caliphate and silver from the Islamic Caliphate was traded north. In the 8th century, changes in the Islamic Caliphate, shifting of power from Damascus to Baghdad, seriously disrupted this. And we think that's one of the factors, along with overpopulation, that caused some people to then look abroad for the precious metals and slaves which would fuel their lifestyles and their economies. So they are scattered groups. Um, sometimes they come together, uh, coalesce in larger groups. Other times they split. At times they fight amongst themselves. So there is no one unifying force. And it has to be said that Vikings is more what you did than what you were. Technically, these are the Norse. They speak Old Norse, or variants of it, across Scandinavia. But Viking is when you go out and do some of this muscular free enterprise. But that has now become associated with the whole culture. So we talk about the Viking Age, Viking Age Scandinavia, the Viking Wars. But primarily there would have been young men out on the spree, out on the make, taking things back to Scandinavia, fueling their lifestyle and eventually carving out little political kingdoms for themselves in the British Isles and along the coasts of what we now call France, and eventually to Iceland, and eventually to Greenland, and eventually to North America. Is, uh, and we're going to get to North America in one second. Is there like a prominent Viking, uh, one who emerged historically as being the most influential one? There are a range of them. And of course, when you think that their range goes all the way from what we now call Kiev or Kiev in Ukraine, the first state there was a, was a Viking uh, Slav state all the way to Greenland, then not surprisingly, you've got various different actors at various different times playing different parts over, you know, a, a, over 300 year period. But as far as North America is concerned, we can particularly focus on Eric the Red, because Eric the Red is a person who is a larger than life character, but a historic character who leads a movement from Iceland, 
others supporting him from Norway to Greenland, and it's his children who will then explore further westward into the North American continent. So if we've got to pick on anybody from the North American perspective, Eric the Red and then Leif Erikson and others are the key place to start. Baking from our childhood just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell Slice, Flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Let me ask you this, okay, this now, I often can't imagine myself living in even the 1950s or the 1900s or even the 1850s or the 1800s, much less the year 1000. What was life like before the turn of that millennium? Well, that's a very good question. Um, basically, it was in some parts of Western Europe, very, very turbulent. Um, we have kingdoms forming in, in a number of places in the British Isles, uh, in Ireland, lots of different rulers as well in Scandinavia, a lot of combinations of warfare, of raiding, of trading. But but, but below that, we've got people seeking to live their ordinary lives. The, the, the majority of people in the, in the population will, will be farmers. Um, there'll be a significant number of slaves. It's a slave economy um, it, it, to, to a significant extent. Uh, but most people aren't slaves. Uh, most people are working on the land. Maybe 10% of the population, a bit less, are in towns in trading positions. And most people are, as today, marrying raising their children, seeking to work, seeking to make a living, uh, seeking to better themselves, mostly on the land with a small percentage in towns. And the Vikings are a big stimulus to trade because they connect up so many different areas. Although we often think about destruction and that's a significant part of the early Viking raids, they should be also as famous for their trading because their connectivity connects the Baltic to, to, to Ireland, to Iceland. They are extraordinary connectors of people uh, and traders of people and of things. Did they call themselves Vikings? No. Well, well, that's that's not strictly true. They would have called themselves Vikings at certain times in their lives. So they would have said, I am going Viking. Um, that meant I'm going out raiding and trading. At other times, they'd have known themselves by their area of Norway. They'd have known themselves by their area of Sweden or Denmark. And those people that they crashed into hardly ever called them Vikings either. Um, for example, in, in Anglo-Saxon England, they are dismissed as the heathens, the pagans. Yeah, they called them jerks. <laughs> yeah, they did not like them at all. Um, um, in, 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 in the Islamic caliphates, when they had problems with them because they, they fought with them, um, both uh, in the Mediterranean, um, on North Africa, um, and on the Caspian Sea. We have Viking fleets fighting Islamic fleets there. They call them the al They are the pagans, and they write, may Allah curse them. So, so people have very complicated relationships with them. They themselves would have used the word Viking, but more as a profession or a time in their lives. You know, Have you gone beyond your Viking phase? Yes, I've settled down. I've found me a wife. We've got some lovely kids now. We've bought a little farm, and the Vikings behind me but my son he's looking forward to his viking phase and anytime now it's about to kick off so it more was a phase of life than it was actual an ethnic term if you see what i mean how many were there at a given time gosh that's really hard to tell because the ancient sources are very very difficult to tell they are often full of 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 numbers which would seem to exaggerate the figures but probably a significant Viking fleet, when it lands and causes real problems, probably doesn't number more than usually mm, 100, 200 people. We've got to think of much smaller scale warfare. For example, in Anglo-Saxon law, any group of people beyond the number of 35 constituted a hera, an army. So in other words, you and 49 of your mates turn up, 50 of you may be there, and you'd have been regarded as being a small army. 
So although they could sometimes come together to make massive fleets, like when they besieged Paris, for example, uh, uh, that was a, a famous siege, um, th then they could number in the several hundreds, but probably it's about 50, 60, maybe 100, 150, causing enough trouble, hit and run, and then striking further down the coast. Yeah. Uh, you say Vikings are a bridge from the old world um, to the new world, and that the center of that tale is the year, about the year 1000. Yeah. What is the prevailing story about their journey to the North American continent? In other words, what's the story? What's, I don't want to say myth, but what's the, the, the general consensus of, you know, that people understand of how they came here? And then how did you begin to unravel that as a historian? It's rooted in two medieval texts. Um, these, these texts are uh, Eric the Red Saga and Saga of the Greenlanders. And they tell a story of a westward movement. So it's a, it's a very American feel about it. It's a westward frontier. It's an expanding westward frontier. And they, they're moving from Ireland and from Norway to Iceland. Iceland is settled in about the 870s. Um, and then about, about a century later, these two stories, which big debate for years as to how historical they were, tell of a further westward movement to lands beyond Greenland. And that's obviously pretty significant because that's going to take us eventually to places that they call Helluland, Stone Slab Land, Markland, Forest Land, and eventually Vinland or Wineland. Uh, and we think that Helluland was the east coast of Baffin Island in the Canadian territory of Nunavut. We think probably Markland was Labrador and Vinland, because it talks about wild grapes growing there and wild wheat growing there, probably somewhere from New Brunswick down south into New England. For a long time, these stories were thought of as being semi-mythological. But to be fair, they don't read like fairy tale. They don't read like myth. The topography is remarkably solid. And there are other medieval texts as well from Iceland that talk about continuing voyages to Greenland in the 13th, sorry, to Greenland and then to Vinland in the 13th and 14th centuries. So clearly something did happen around the year 1000, but the historicity of it was open to debate until the 1960s. And in the 1960s, solid archaeological evidence was found in Newfoundland for Norse settlement, which in 2021 was dated using dendrochronology, that's tree ring dating, to 1021. So we now know there were Vikings in the New World. They were definitely at Newfoundland, at Launceau Meadow. They were there in 1021. We found other evidence for Norse artifacts across the Canadian Arctic and Subarctic. And at Launceau Meadows, they found butternuts and other types of wood, which means they must have gone further south, possibly as far south as Maine, possibly even down to Connecticut, possibly no further south than New Brunswick, but very possibly into New England itself, because these things don't grow and never grew on Newfoundland. That's so a, the archaeology it wood, has it, reinforced it. It was wood that they found that had to have come from, from the Norse area. What what they found at Launceau Meadows was a series of, of four of four construction buildings sites, which were all in Norse style. So they, they were of the type of buildings found in Greenland, for example. Uh -huh. um, the, the artifacts that were found there uh, were clearly uh, Norse artifacts, metalwork and so on. The, the wood that was cut down there had been cut down using metal axes, which were not used by Native Americans at the time. Um, and then they did the dating of some of the wood that had been cut down there, and they found that it had been cut down in 1021. So Europeans were on Newfoundland cutting down trees in 1021, but they were also leaving behind white walnuts or butternuts, which they must have got further south in what we now think is Vinland, because further south from New Brunswick, further south, we've got 
grapes growing wild, the fox grape, and we've got um, wheat growing wild, both mentioned in the sagas. So they must have gone a lot further south. And that opens up a whole can of worms, like how far south and how far into the North American continent. And that's when it gets really contested. Well, I'll tell you, I can't even fathom what that trip across an ocean was like in the year 1021. In the year 1021, um, what were they looking for? My goodness, uh, what what a journey. Um, how did the events of January 6th and the Vikings cross paths? Well, that is a very, very good question because the Vikings have become utilized since the 18th century as part of the deep story of America. In 1773, Benjamin Franklin wrote that about 25 years earlier, a Swedish friend of his had told him that northern people had come to North America before the time of Columbus. In 1816, there's a lecture in New York about how Vikings may well have got to America. In the 1830s, we see the sagas being translated into English and taking off in North America, and we see a pushback from the mid 19th century onward against Columbus, because clearly Columbus is part of the origin myth of North America, but he never got to North America. And in the 19th century, there were anxieties about the fact he was a Southern European um, and he was a Catholic, and there was pushback by the white Anglo Saxon protestants ag against this so much so uh, that in 1893 when the world's columbian exposition took place in chicago a replica of a viking ship was moored off chicago as a pushback against columbus so they get picked up by people in the 19th century particularly as scandinavian settlement occurs into North America, into the Midwest, as a way of claiming prior ownership. So in 1898, a runestone is found, in inverted commas, the Kensington runestone in Minnesota. And from that moment onwards, they become part of the contested history of when did white Europeans actually get to North America? That gets picked up again in the 1930s as part of the... Um, the, the Nordicist beliefs of, of right-wing Americans in the 1930s and in the 1940s. It then gets picked up in a way that is much more benign um, in the 1960s comic book culture, um, as we see in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But there's always a particular American take Thor, on it. Thor, right? Thor is a Viking. Yeah, abs yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And the others are there too, but particularly Thor and in all the films and, and so on. And, and there's a particular American interest in this. But there's always a dark subcurrent as well, that along with the general interest in Vikings and their American appearance as it were which we find in comic book culture and films there is always this belief beneath the surface in other areas of interest an interest in who are the white muscular people who came here who set up america as it should be run in inverted commas so for example in the charlottesville unite the right ra ra rally in 2017 there are viking symbols on display at the Capitol building on January the 6th, 2021, the guy with the horns also is covered with Viking tattoos. And the use of these symbols and also of Odinist white supremacist ideology is now part of the varied right wing narrative. For example, the white supremacist Jeremy Christian sentenced to life imprisonment in 2020 for the murder of two fellow passengers on a max train in 2017, posted on Facebook, Hail Vinland, that word again, hail victory vinland vikings you see and it's not it's not it's not limited to the usa and canada uh, anders breivik the norwegian extremist who murdered 77 people in 2011 carved the names of norse gods into his guns and the perpetrator of the new zealand christchurch massacre in march 2019 posted on 8chan message board i will see you all in valhalla the legendary home of Viking gods before carrying out mass shootings at two mosques, which left 51 people dead and 40 injured. So within this complex cocktail of interest in the historic Vindham Vikings, there has also been a very disturbing seizure of them as basically white muscular warriors who were then seen as the prototypes of modern white muscular warriors.
who see themselves as engaged in the culture wars of the 21st century, linking 1021 to 2021. The synchronicity of it is quite extraordinary. You have spent your life dedicated to examining these figures and examining their impact. How much does that hurt you? How sad is that for you to see these symbols used in this way? Or does do you not get that close to it? It's disturbing. It's obviously very disturbing to see any aspect of history, be it the Crusades or the Vikings, used as part of the modern culture wars, which are dividing Western society and which America is no stranger to. It's tragic. It distresses me a great deal. It also distresses me because it can taint the brand, if you see what I mean. It can make some people a bit bit reluctant, a bit wary about studying a perfectly valid area of history, the Vinland Vikings, where did they go? How significant were they? Because they have become so associated with violent alt-right ideology. And that distresses me too, because these are fascinating people. They did come into conflict with Native Americans. We know that. Um, violent conflict. So these are not simple, peaceful settlers who arrived around the year 1000. There are, there is violent conflict too. But the questions about that, about their relationships with Native Americans, about why they got there, their significance, these are valid historical questions. And I would not want people to be wary of engaging with them because the topic has been hijacked in violent ways by modern white supremacists. I've interviewed people who have had to examine documents in German and in French and in um, different Asiatic languages. I'm really curious what your sources were for this topic, how many still exist, and what language this stuff was in, and, and were you able to, and how were you able to ferret it all out? The, the language that most of it is primarily written in is Old Norse, um, which is the origins of modern Scandinavian languages and is most closely related to modern Icelandic. Um, I'm assisted in this by the fact that my, my eldest daughter and I wrote a book some time ago, um, or a couple of books on the Vikings, and she reads Old Norse. Um, so that certainly assisted me in that's my convenient. views of it. Yes, my, my, my Old Norse being somewhat limited. Um, <laughs> we're also helped by the fact that most of the sources now exist in modern English translations. So we have excellent translations of the various sagas, um, of the various documents. Um, and these include runestones from Scandinavia and also some Latin sources as well in, 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 in very good modern translations. So I was assisted by both those who speak Old Norse and read Old Norse a lot better than I do, um, but also by excellent academic modern translations that one can use in that one can use and they are available i mean if, if you go on to you know any 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 online site or, or any you know, bricks and mortar bookstore you can find really excellent translations of the icelandic sagas and and get into it yourself and read it yourself. they're very engaging dramatic shocking um this really is a, a, a exciting historo fiction as it were but but the, it's rooted in his history so i recommend people you know, read Red Saga, read Saga of the Greenlanders. They're really interesting stuff. And make up your own mind about how far to America you think it got. Then, then everybody will get their maps out and, and, and they'll get their uh, holiday photographs out and they'll have all their speculations about, I think that's what they mean. I think that's what they mean. And the problem is there's enough ambiguity to keep people guessing for oh, generations to come yet. What was the downfall of the Vikings? Um, you know, every society um, has its end. What... Um, from what I understand, it went to about 1,200 or so. Uh, where and how did the Vikings and their culture and their lifestyle meet their end? Everywhere they went, uh, they assimilated rapidly with about two generations to people living locally. So, for example, um, almost in every place, they, they, they converted to Christianity, for example, within a generation or two generations of actually arriving there. That's all the way from Kiev all the way to Ireland. And at that point, they then became regular players within, within the context of where they were. They, they sort of lost their Vikingness, as it were. Back in the homelands, uh, kingdoms emerged in Denmark and Norway and eventually Sweden. Um, they then became Christianized, converted to Christianity. And although war is still part in, of, of the mix, they then become part of what you might call the regular state arrangements and treaties and so on um, of, 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 of their age. So to some extent, they're kind of they're quite chameleon. 
they kind of reinvent themselves successfully almost out of existence. But in North America, the key thing is they are too far. It, it's a stretch too far. It's just too far. The population of Greenland is, is too small to sustain a significant settlement in North America. It's at the ends of their supply lines. They face a pushback, a violent pushback by Native Americans, although it has to be said that there's evidence in the sagas of Vikings being the ones who use the violence first against Native Americans. So that there, there is a, a very disturbing aspect to that too. But basically they, they have a pushback from people who know the land, who are there in numbers and who are not gonna be pushed around. And they do not have sufficient numbers themselves to secure their settlement. So we think that probably the Viking settlement in North America lasted at its most from about 1021 to about the 1120s, 1130s, with sporadic visits, often for wood, which is a big, big shortage in Greenland, um, up until the 14th century. And at that point, climatic conditions shut down this Western movement, such that Norse settlement on Greenland is snuffed out by the end of the 14th century, century by an increasingly cold snap that will turn into the Little Ice Age. So to start with, their supply line is extended. They haven't got the population to, sust to sustain this westward movement. Changing climatic conditions shut down Greenland and they no longer sell to Vinland after that. And it seems to then be a myth for two to 300 years before we then rediscover them and realize it was not a myth at all. They really were here, larger than life, but they were there. Hmm. What impact, um, I love asking questions about presidents and presidential history. What impact have Vikings had on the imaginations of our American presidents? Well, uh, it's interesting that uh, Leif Erikson's day um, is is, um, is still celebrated in, in the States, not an official holiday, uh, but every year uh, a, a president declares how America owes a great deal to its, uh, its, its Scandinavian, uh, Scandinavian origins. I think they have they have contributed something to the concept of American exceptionalism and um, the idea that even here, you know, there were Vikings so far from home carving out a new world. I think they've contributed to this concept of westward movement um, and, and, and of European settlement. Now, these have both negative and positive aspects to them, as you can imagine, and particularly any Native American listening to this is going to be very aware of the negative aspects of European settlement um, in the USA. But I, but I think they have contributed this idea of westward movement, of, of manifest destiny, of carving out a new a new world, you know, old old world people carving out a new world world home and i think that is part of it and i think they're in the mix and today because of the particular or right aspect of it they are very much within a quite a violent and a contested mix at a time of culture wars when nations are asking questions about themselves who are we what are we where do we come from and america is facing those big questions as we all are and, and we watch america's self-questioning at the moment and vinland vikings are part of that mix did they imagine they'd be remembered a thousand years later? I can just imagine a, a young guy, as you put it, going Viking and saying, our journey is going to last the rest of, you know, the rest of this planet's life. We're going to be known the world over for what we've accomplished. That's a really good question, isn't it? Yes, that's a really good question. I, I think these were people that took their, their idea of posterity quite seriously. Uh, I think they had quite, quite a sense of heroic uh, heroic ca character, self-worth, her heroic presentation. The idea, they were very much part of a story culture that said people will tell stories about me and my doings long after I'm not here. So whilst I think they would be astonished to think that in 2023, you and I are having this conversation about what was a very <laughs> small aspect of the Viking diaspora in North America. They might be astonished by that. I think they might not be entirely surprised because I think they had quite a buoyant view of themselves um, and, and, and quite a view of themselves as heroic people doing heroic deeds. And so maybe the idea that people are talking about it a thousand years on, maybe it wouldn't have been a complete surprise. But even so, they might have just a little bit surprised how they've been commercialized and merchandised 
but then they were they were they were traders as well as raiders so perhaps they could see they could see the angle and the percentage in that as well all right so i gotta ask this what is with all these brands viking and they go they run the gamut i mean there's a book publishing company there's as i said a football team there's a line of ovens and refrigerators called viking prestigious brand very expensive stuff what's with that i have often pondered <laughs> this because there is no one common denominator is there yeah i mean it, it's everything from viking patisseries uh <laughs> to, 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 to viking law firms um yeah, right. um yeah i've pondered this and the only thing i can think is that the vikings have 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 an image of strength of drive of of energy um the, which, which some of that is quite gendered i have to say and often these tend, these things tend to get associated with gendered male activities um but in but increasingly that concept has has wide appeal to anybody who who, who wants something that his that is historic um that has energy that has drive that has imagination um it's a bit like why are pioneers exciting you know why are cowboys exciting why is the wild west popular i think if you can answer that then you've answered the questions why why Vikings, and that too can then break out of gender stereotypes and, 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 and appeal to everybody because they can be made. They can be made to represent strength and courage and adversity and um, daring do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can set to one side the violence and the dark side, and we can focus on the Halloween costume Viking, as it were, rather than the guy with the axe who you wish was not bashing at your door. Is the perception of Vikings different in their homeland of Scandinavia as it is in America? There's huge pride in the Viking achievement uh, in the Scandinavian homelands. And there's huge interest in the, in the Vikings, for example, in my own country, the United Kingdom, where they contributed to a significant part of the, the, the cultural DNA of my own country. There was a Viking kingdom at York, for example, uh, the kingdom of Jorvik. So they are very very popular and i i think i think within scandinavia there's that sense of you know there was a time when scandinavia dictated policy to western europe and i think that has appeal there is this sense also people say well it's not just violence we we were traders that connected you know the eastern baltic and, and, and the caliphate of the middle east you know to iceland and greenland so that is an extraordinary cultural achievement there is also great pride in the literature the, the, the saar Sagas of the Icelanders, mostly written down in Iceland, interesting enough, in the 13th century, usually written by Christians, actually, but at a time when the beliefs were no longer held by the community, are extraordinary works of history meets literature meets mythology meets drama and there is an understandable pride within the norse speaking world in that cultural contribution to world literature so the vikings globally are a very buoyant brand their pr people have done very well over a thousand years if you could change one thing about how vikings are perceived in our modern culture if you could hammer one thing into all our heads I guess, aside for the white supremacist violence yeah. stuff, because that's self-evident, um, I hope. Uh, what would it be? What would you change about what we think about Vikings? I would say see them as explorers and traders as much as raiders and attackers, because it's the raiders and attackers which understandably got a lot of airtime at the time, and you know, understandably so, and was a feature of the Viking Age. But below that and alongside that, there were Viking families on the move. There were Viking traders on the move. Oh, sorry, but there were Norse. So I should say there were Norse families and Norse traders and Norse people on the move because, of course, the Vikings were the particular type of people doing the muscular free enterprise. So remember, this is as much about Norse culture and the movement of Norse peoples as it is about a particular strata of society going out doing Viking. So remember the explorers and the traders of this Norse world as well as the muscular violence of the Viking experience itself. Uh, you're an expert in Christmas, and I've got to ask, um, this could be a whole episode <laughs> beyond this. I mean, let's just but be clear, but um, uh, what is the most important thing for us to know as we embark 
as an American society on celebrating Christmas? What's the most important thing to know about the modern iteration of it? I think the most important thing about Christmas is that Christmas shows us the the role of of the marginalized and the poor and the rejected at the center of this celebration. I'm a Christian. I'm a licensed lay minister in the Church of England, and I'll be preaching on Christmas Day, um, and I'm preaching this Sunday as well. And one of the things that I will be saying to people is that alongside the tinsel, put it to one side, alongside the baubles, put it to one side, there is a story here of faith, and obviously not everybody buys into the faith side of it. I do. Not everybody does. But the story fundamentally at the core of this is the love of God seen in a child who was rejected, for whom there was no room at the inn or the guest place, who fled as a political refugee into Egypt, um, who did not use violence against those people who he who contested his message and who basically was executed by an occupying power because he stood for a different way of life. Now, even if people don't buy into the faith aspects of Christmas, they can surely stop and think about the message set against our world today where so often power and wealth and force are the deciding things in 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 society and here we have a baby shivering in a manger with a young mother and raising a whole bunch of questions about who he was and what he said and his significance and let's pull the tinsel to one side put the baubles to one side and let's engage with whatever our final conclusions are the fundamental core story of Christmas. It's very gritty, it's very earthy, and it's very down to earth, and it's very challenging to a world that often cons is concerned with consumerism, power, and wealth. Martin Wittick, the author of American Vikings, How the Norse Sailed into the Lands uh, and Imaginations of America. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on the show. Check out the book. Also check out his social media feed on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Martin Historian, and that's Martin with a Y. I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash axelbankhistory. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axelbank Reports, History, and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors, and why their books matter right now. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axelbank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. See you next time. Thanks.